Well, welcome everybody to the Heritage Foundation, the Russell Kirk Lecture Series. My name is Joseph Lacanti. I'm the director of the Simon Center uh, for American Studies here at Heritage. And just some housekeeping items before I forget. Number one, all of you attendees, if, if you could put yourselves there in listen-only uh, mode, that would be great, at least for now. Uh, the session will be recorded and it'll be available in about 48 hours. And then if you've got any questions, once uh, uh, Mr. Riley delivers his remarks, any questions uh, throughout, uh, in the speaker box, you got a, a questions box, uh, excuse me, uh, for those questions in the questions box. So just put them there uh, and we'll, we'll get it, uh, to those questions as many as we can. Well, let me again welcome everybody. This is really the first lecture in the fall uh, for our Russell Kirk lecture series. We're delighted you guys could join us. Thanks for taking the time out. Um, just over 50 years ago, in 1969, a prominent conservative thinker published a modest little book called Enemies of the Permanent Things. Enemies of the Permanent Things. Russell Kirk had already established himself as the leading American philosopher of conservatism. His earlier book, The Conservative Mind, was the first attempt to explain and to defend conservatism as a comprehensive intellectual movement. But a lot had happened in American society between 1953 uh, in 1969, and Kirk felt impelled to warn us of the great threats to our republic and how to meet them. In his latest book, Kirk reminded conservatives that our democratic society depended upon the permanent things, the permanent things, the ideals and traditions embedded in our Western, classical, and Christian inheritance. Kirk upheld these ideals uh, wherever he found them, in politics, in philosophy, and especially in literature. Kirk praised the ability of authors such as J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis to draw our hearts and minds toward ancient truths by engaging what he called our moral imagination, our moral imagination through storytelling. Listen to Kirk. Imagination, he wrote, does rule the world. Let that one soak in. Imagination rules the world, according to Kirk. Kirk's conservative imagination covered the canvas of Western civilization, its ideals and institutions, which he believed found magnificent expression in the American founding. Like no conservative thinker had ever attempted, Kirk argued that the roots of the American order, the title of another of his important books, were planted deep in the Western Christian tradition. Kirk's insights are more important now than ever. The progressive left is engaged in its own project of imagination. Yeah, imagination. They're intoxicated with a radical, secular, utopian vision of American society. And in their feverish designs, there is no space for the permanent things. And so they treat with contempt the beliefs and ideas that Define the American Revolution and the Constitution, the founding, individual liberty, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, the rule of law, private property, the separation of powers, equal justice, government by consent of the governed. All of these concepts are under assault in ways that none of us has ever seen. And the attack on the American founding, surprisingly, it comes not only from the left, it comes from the right, on the extreme right. The principles of human freedom embedded in the Declaration of the Constitution, to many on the right, they're a dangerous deception, a lethal cancer unleashed by the Enlightenment, they say, that has rotted the bone and the marrow of our republic. To these conservatives, John Locke's political vision of consensual government, so influential on the American founders, was no better than that of Robespierre and the gang that gave us the guillotine. Well, all of this mental confusion, and I think it is a lot of mental confusion, it makes the arrival of Robert Riley's new book, America on Trial, A Defense of the Founding, a very welcome and happy event. I've cracked open at least one uh, bottle of Prosecco on my own. It is a book that is nourished by 25 years of government service, where Mr. Riley sought to apply the principles of American exceptionalism to public policy. He served as a special assistant to President Reagan, 
Later on, as director of the Voice of America under President Bush, senior advisor to Iraq's Ministry of Information during Operation Iraqi Freedom, and as senior advisor to, to the U.S. Secretary of Defense. Mr. Ali, uh, however, is no stranger to the Heritage Foundation. As director of government information in 1981, he launched Heritage's outreach to the executive branch. And then he returned as a visiting fellow in 1989, 1989, the year of the century. And Heritage published uh, his monograph, Ideas Matter, Restoring the Content of U.S. Public Diplomacy. Now, in addition to politics and uh, policy, Mr. Riley also has a passion for music, for music. He's the author of Surprised by Beauty, a listener's guide to the recovery of modern music. One book reviewer who disagreed with Mr. Riley's faith commitments nevertheless admired his, quote, pugnacious intellect. I love that, his pugnacious intellect. And then the reviewer goes on. He's a conservative with a veritable army of ideas, seemingly all of which he can relate to classical music. Now, how many people can you say that of? I think uh, Russell Kirk would be thrilled with this full-bodied expression of conservatism. In America on Trial, the subject of our topic today here, in the spirit of Russell Kirk, Mr. Riley traces the long historic lineage of ideas that flowed like a mighty river across the American political landscape, from the ancient Hebrews to the Magna Carta, to the medieval theologians, to John Locke and the founders of Philadelphia. It is an account of the alliance between reason and revelation in the cause of freedom. It's a defense of the origins of the American story that can stir our moral imagination. Russell Kirk, I suspect, would recommend Mr. Riley's account as a tonic for our cultural malaise. Listen to Russell Kirk. In a revolutionary epic, sometimes men taste every novelty, sicken of them all, and return to ancient principles so long disused that they seem refreshingly hearty when they are rediscovered. I can think of few people as well qualified as Robert Riley to help us to rediscover these ancient principles. So let's give him a warm heritage welcome, Robert Riley. Dr. LeConte, thank you so much for that warm welcome. It's deeply appreciated especially since it's a homecoming to heritage. And I want to uh, approve my bona fides at heritage sartorially by making sure everyone can see ta -da, my heritage tie, which I think Ed Fulner probably handed me back in 1980. So if there's a costume museum at Heritage, at some point, I would consider donating my tie to it. Uh, I not only need to thank Joe, I need to thank um, well, Angela Saylor, whom we thought she would be with us at the top of the program. I understand Angela is home, feeling a bit under the weather. If you're watching, Angela, I, I hope you're feeling better. I also wanted to thank King, Kim Holmes, the Heritage Vice President, for his enthusiastic support for the book. That's meant a great deal to me. Now, I, a, a few words about Russell Kirk. Particularly pleased and honored to speak under the aegis of the Russell Kirk Lecture Series because I knew Russell Kirk very well. I was at his house often for long, magical evenings. I, I learned a great deal from this tremendous man of letters. But I also learned other things when I could see what an extraordinarily charitable, charitable and humble man he was in hidden ways that one wouldn't notice uh, through a cursory uh, a, um, a run in with him. But soon you'd see in his house, there was always a refugee family. It could be from Ethiopia, it could be from Vietnam, but Russell was always caring for others. He was not a wealthy man, but he gave of what he had to help those without. He was an inspiration as a human being. Now we got you, Bob. Just pick it up from about yeah. a minute. 
All right. Well, I simply say I expressed my great admiration for Russell Kirk. So I'll begin yeah. with, with this citation from Abraham Lincoln. When he said in 1862 in a message to Congress, we shall nobly save or meanly lose the last best hope of Earth. Maybe even more so today, it is clear that currently we are meanly losing. Later in the message, uh, Lincoln said, quote, we must disenthrall ourselves and then we shall save our country, unquote. And so we must disenthrall ourselves from the ideologies that have distorted and contorted the American founding of which we consider ourselves today either the beneficiaries or the victims. And today there appear to be more victims than beneficiaries. Let me explain. The attacks on the American founding are nothing new, particularly those coming from the Marxist or pseudo Marxist Leninist left. Uh, the program there has been clear since the 19th century. Uh, all self-interest is material self-interest. Man is incapable of doing anything other than his self-interest. Therefore, the founding ipso facto was an act of self-interest by the founders. End of story. Nothing noble about it. It was an act of sheer self-interest. But we know this. We're familiar with this that the Antifa people are in the streets demonstrating and protesting against this ignoble founding uh, is no surprise. It's happened before, it's happening again, perhaps with a little more destructive energy. I'd be happy to comment on that a little later in the lecture. Uh, now, the really upsetting thing though are the new sources of critique against the American founding not coming from the radical left, but by coming from the conservative, Christian, and especially Catholic right. Why is that? What's going on there? Well, my book, uh, they put forth what, what I call the poison pill critique. The poison pill thesis is that the American founding contained a poison pill with a time release formula. We are its victims. What was the poison pill? What was the original sin contained in the American founding? It wasn't slavery, which is what the far left says it was. It was the enlightenment influence of radical individual autonomy. And as the forces of Christianity in the United States, as in 1776, the United States was an overwhelmingly Christian country, as the forces of Christianity began to recede, so these incipient principles of radical individual autonomy began to get a greater grip on the American soul. And they certainly got a greater grip on the jurisprudence of uh, Justice Robert Kennedy. So, and we see in some of his Supreme Court decisions, in his Texas decision, when he found in the Constitution uh, a right to sodomy, uh, he used the word individual autonomy to justify it. Such a word, by the way, appears nowhere in any constitutional document. But he thought it was there in a penumbra or somewhere and decided to use it. And then about 10 years later, in the Obergefell versus Hodges decision, he likewise uh, produced a, in the Constitution, a constitutional right to homosexual so-called marriage, uh, to which all the states then had to accede. Uh, it has been the Supreme Court, I caution you, that has been legislating for the United States in the most revolutionary social matters affecting this country. 
not the legislatures, the state legislatures or the Congress. Uh, they do try to legislate, but they, of course, are overruled by this Congress, uh, sorry, by the Supreme Court, which envisages itself as receiving messages from the ether. Uh, now, the curious thing is that the school of certain conservative Catholic thinkers on the right claim that, well, Justice Robert Kennedy is really right. There really is this idea of radical individual uh, autonomy in the American founding, and uh, we are getting its full measure today. How else do you explain the disintegration of the family, uh, wholesale abortion, the flood of pornography, drugs, homosexual marriage, transsexual uh, operations and, and new status and law? Um, the difference between them and Kennedy is Kennedy celebrates these changes and they despise them. So they both agree, however, unfortunately, that that radical individual autonomy uh, ingested from the French Enlightenment is what did it to us. And sooner or later, it would take us down. And it is why, by the way, we are now beginning to assume the proportions of the Hobbesian state. Uh, we can touch upon that much later. Well, the two people of whom I'm talking are uh, uh, Michael Denby at the John Paul II Institute and uh, Patrick Deneen at Notre Dame, both very fine scholars and uh, profound thinkers, for both from whom I've learned a great deal, who are right about just about everything, but profoundly wrong about this. And so in my book, I examine what evidence there might be to support this idea that uh, Justice Roberts' uh, readings were not a derailment of the American founding and of constitutional law, but rather a fulfillment of it. And I find there's no evidence there at all. But I, I conclude they don't have a leg to stand on. Historically, it's not there. But that is not the heart of the book. The heart of the book asks the question, well, if the founding's not responsible, if these ideas <clears throat> were not corrupted by influence from the French Enlightenment, from where did these ideas come? What was their origin? What was their providence? And this long journey over several thousand years uh, led me on quite an adventure in tracking down the origin of the ideas, who had them, how they were received contemporaneously at the time, and how their influence through those thousands of years finally reached the United States, excuse me, and made conceivable this great American founding, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, excuse me, the Constitution. Since I have so little time, I'm going to have to abbreviate terribly. I begin, but I don't think any of the contributions I spend my time spelling out can be understood without first setting the context of what the ancient world was like without Jewish revelation, without Greek philosophy, and without the incarnation of Christ. What was that world like? It was a tribal world. It was a world in which there was no vocabulary for such a thing as a human being. Uh, the modus vivendi in the tribal world was usually war, occasionally interrupted by uh, peace pacts for a period of time. But wars were a steady diet. <clears throat> the results of the wars were the, the death of all the men, the enslavement of all <clears throat> the women and children who lost. 
and either the people doing the slaughter or enslaving or those being slaughtered and enslaved would have been able to raise no moral objection as to what was being done because the people who lost the battle would have done exactly the same thing to the victors had they overcome them. The, again, this was the modus vivendi, and the, the, the critical thing is that it had no moral vocabulary, vocabulary through which it could occur to them that there was anything wrong to treating another human being in this way. How did the thoughts of that first arrive? And this takes me on the journey to ancient classical Greece, even to pre-Socratic philosophy with people like Heraclitus and Anaximander, who examined the universe and came up with a query. It seems that the world is ordered and the character of this order is that it's rational. And we have been endowed with reason that is capable of apprehending this rational order so we can grasp it, we can understand it. We can come to see how the world works. How, how could this be, they wondered. And the answer they came up with is behind this there must be a divine intelligence. And Heraclitus, uh, so far as we know, is the first one who used the word, the logos, to describe that divine intelligence. The logos, of course, is the Greek word for reason or word. Now, as Greek philosophy developed later, we had, uh, of course, the great Plato, the great Socrates, who bring us the teachings of how our purpose in life can be discerned by apprehending the nature of things, their essences, what makes them what they are. And within what they are, their natures uh, contain a purpose. By nature, we know what the perfection of a thing is, when we know its nature, uh, say you've got a, um, uh, an acorn. If you know what an acorn is, you know it will become an oak tree if it's given the proper soil and moisture. And when it grows into a fully mature uh, a, a oak tree, you know it, it's reached now the perfection of itself as an oak tree. So you have potency in act, you have the growth of something into the fulfillment of what it is, it becomes fully what it is supposed to be, what it ought to be, and that, that therefore it reaches its perfection. Now with man, it's a completely different operation because he is the one being who can um, act against his nature. The, what, what his nature uh, directs him toward in terms of his end is just as clear for man as it was for the oak tree. The problem is man is a rational being and he has a free will as to whether he's going to comport himself to his nature. So in order to reach his perfection, to flourish as a human being, what must he do? He must choose virtuous acts. The finest man, the perfected man is the virtuous man who then is in a position to engage in contemplation of the ultimate good, which is God. And through that contemplation become a God as most as man can, God-like. This was Aristotle's vision and it was galvanizing one. And it's through the concept of nature we could come to see what is good for man and what is bad for man, morally speaking, what is bad for him is what would keep him from flourishing, reaching his perfection. The good things are those that would bring him to that flourishing. <clears throat> and so we see in the great work of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, how you do that, how you live a life of virtue, how do you know what virtue is and so forth and how it brings you a life of happiness. Now, I must move on now to the great contribution of the Jews. 
you must understand when this was made in the Middle East, the Jews lived in a sea of polytheism and pantheism. All the surrounding cultures had expressions of those two forms of belief. Uh, gods created the world, um, take the Babylonians or the Akkadians or uh, the Sumers, and the, the gods created the earth and made explicitly clear that why did they create it? They created it in order to enslave man. Man was the slave of the gods. And of course, the gods acted capriciously, so this made man's situation slightly tenuous in the order of things. Now, in Jerusalem, this extraordinary revelation took place of not the gods, but a god. And not only a god, but a god entirely out of this world, a totally transcendent god. None of the ancient mythologies conceived that there was a, any such thing as the transcendent. There was certainly the highest point in the universe in the Empyrean, but nothing outside of it, which is exactly from where Yahweh came. So Yahweh creates, but he doesn't create man to be a slave. Everything he creates is good. And the refrain after each day of creation is, and God saw that it was good. This was unique in terms of the surrounding cultures as well. And the thing he found particularly good that he made was man, who he said, I have made in my image and likeness. This is one of the foundational statements in the text of Genesis that man is made in the image and likeness of God. Extraordinary. No surrounding culture had any statement in their mythology that came close to this. And here is the first inkling that each individual person has something in themselves that is sacrosanct and inviolable. That man may not use that person as an instrument for the satisfaction of his own passions, but must respect in that person the image of God in place within him. I would suggest to you, I, I, in the audience, I only wish I could see you, uh, there are probably a number of you who are engaged in human rights works, as, as I am myself. And whether you're from the left or the right, uh, if you are in human rights work, you are in some way uh, a beneficiary. Even if you're not a Jew or a Christian, you are a beneficiary of Genesis and its statement that we're made in the image and likeness of God. In fact, I would even go so far as to say that Genesis is the basis of our civilization. The great John Adams, our founder, thought so. In fact, he accounted the influence of the Israelites to be even more important than that uh, of ancient Greek philosophy in forming uh, the United States. Uh, regardless. Now, the, the next most revolutionary event that affected the American founding was the incarnation, the coming of Christ as that promised Messiah. Of course, most Jews didn't accept him as the Messiah, and they're still waiting for the Messiah. But nonetheless, many people did, as did many Gentiles. The extraordinary thing about the incarnation and the claims of Jesus Christ are, are these. Uh, one, he is introduced in the, the electrifying lines at the beginning of the Gospel of St. John, as in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God and all things were made through him as Logos. Now we know. You see here in St. John, in that gospel, 
is speaking in a way that the Hellenistic world, which had subsumed the Middle East largely, could understand the nature of the revelation they had just been given. Because Greek philosophy, as we said at the top, used this word, the logos, to describe the divine intellect. And now it would be as if Heraclitus speculating on the existence of logos met the logos walking through the door. That's the galvanizing effect of the incarnation. Excuse me. Now the other matter, <clears throat> in Genesis, we know that uh, Yahweh is a provident God. We know he enters creation with his revelation. We know that he has a plan to rescue man. <clears throat> and in terms of for Christians, that, that providential plan is incarnated in Christ. Now, he enacts that uh, salvific plan on the cross by giving his life for the redemption of man, to solve the terrible uh, problem that original sin had inflicted, not only on man himself, but on the entire uh, order of the world. And that this Messiah, this Christ, was going to be able to renew the world and, and make salvation available to all, not that just to Jews, to everyone. Within this revelation, it is made amply clear that God has for each individual person an infinite love, a salvific infinite love for the first time in history. Man is not reliant upon his tribe, upon his policy, his city state, his pharaonic empire or the Babylonian kings to speak to God on his behalf, to convey his prayers. No, that's over. With the arrival of Christianity, each individual person has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the incarnate God. No longer is the state the means through which man must exercise his religious life. No longer is the state a salvific engine to bring man to his destiny. The state has been removed from the business of reaching the highest things. And this makes very clear that the state is not the highest thing. As Christ famously said, when he, they tried to trick him with the denarius, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. It, it, it uh, registered in the crowd. They said they were amazed. Well, well, might they be amazed because no one had ever said a thing like this. Everything used to be Caesar's. But now there was a claim there were things that were God's. And this eventuated into the uh, two-sword teaching that we would see later in the Middle Ages, in which uh, there is a spiritual realm that has its autonomy, and there is a temporal realm which exercises its autonomy, both for, for different ends. The, the temporal end to create a tranquility in the civil order, the spiritual end to concentrate on helping man reach his highest end, which is union with Christ. Now, the demarcations between the, the, these two sovereignties, there was a lot of bump and nudging through the middle, early Middle Ages as who had the authority to do various things. But after several hundred years, it was pretty much worked out. The, the fascinating thing is, is one individual was under two sovereignties. Not one sovereignty could, could uh, claim the whole man. 
Neither the state could say, you're all mine, you are totally subservient to me, nor could the church say, you're all mine. Forget the temporal order. No, no, the temporal order was legitimate in its sphere. This was a unique development. And in the interstices of these two uh, sovereignties, a great avenue uh, uh, for freedom opened up for medieval man. Now, I'll move quickly to, I can't, I can't go into any detail on how these influences from Athens, Jerusalem, and the Christian influences, which I, I just used the city Rome to indicate them, uh, were assimilated and came together in Christendom. Because it was in Christendom starting in the alert, early 11th century that all of the modern constitutional principles were developed, enunciated, and enacted. How did this happen? It happened with the creation of ecclesiastical corporations and the puzzle as to how they ought to be run, because there had not been corporations before. They used a little Roman law to do it, but they came up with their own canon laws. And they were based on several fundamental things. One was the popular sovereignty, the equality of people. Now, if you have popular sovereignty and the equality of the people, uh, their consent is required in their rule. I'm speaking about, say, in the Dominican order. Now, how is that consent to be expressed? For instance, in the first general conclave of the uh, Dominican order, St. Dominic, said, I, I want uh, each chapter house to elect representatives to come to the conclave. And what is decided on the conclave by majority vote uh, will be decisive for all of us uh, because it will be sovereign. Uh, and even I will be under uh, that the sovereignty of the conclave. I won't be able to overrule it. I, I will be subject to his laws just as is everyone else. Now, this uh, means of self-rule in the religious orders expanded to other religious orders and to church councils and even to the election of the popes where when majority rule is required, well, what does a majority mean? And in those church councils, the canon law came up with the uh, uh, stipulation had to be two thirds majority. Now, these influence leached into the secular realm because canon lawyers were dual hatted. They worked indeed in the church, but they also worked in the royal courts and in the secular sphere. And you see the early parliaments ingesting uh, these same principles of uh, equality, popular sovereignty, the requirement of consent, the right to representation, and here's the big one the right to revolution. In other words, the king or the prince did not receive his power uh, by divine right. God did not come down and directly appoint and anoint a member of this family and say, you have absolute power to rule over everyone else. That, that didn't happen. So they said that God's, of course, all authority is God, but, but God's invested his authority in the people. That's the origin of the notion of popular sovereignty. And through their consent, the people conveyed sovereignty to the ruler on certain conditions that he keep the compact with which the people made the king the king. Now, if during the king's reign, he abjures that compact by which sovereignty was transferred to him in very grave conditions, the people have the right to revolution. Thomas Aquinas and others are very careful in stipulating the conditions which would justify the right to revolution, but it's there 
it was widely accepted and embraced. And much of what I've said here shortly can explain the, the general character of the Middle Ages, which I'm sure is going to be a surprise to a lot of you because it doesn't comport with the popular image. The question now arises, how is it that this constitutional Middle Age order didn't, wasn't that transferred directly to the American founding? There wouldn't have been any need for an American Revolution. Well, the reason is because in the late Middle Ages and in the Renaissance following it, some key principles were overturned. And the key one was theological. William of Ockham, a priest in the late Renaissance, uh, sorry, in the late medieval period, the stipulated flipped the key conceptual uh, theological notion that was said by Thomas Aquinas and many others, that in God's essence, in his nature, reason is primary, not will. Reason decides, the will executes. The will follows reason. This will help you understand why we live in a rational order and why God himself does not act unreasonably, because he is reason. He's not willful, he's reasonable. So his will enacts his reason. Now, William of Ockham said, no, we're going to flip this relationship. In God, now will is primary, the will, and reason is secondary. Reason is simply the executor of whatever the will decides. It'll find the easiest ways to execute what the will has decided upon. So the will is primary now. And what does that mean? William of Ockham spelled it out very clearly that God is, he understands God's omnipotence now <clears throat> in the sense that uh, God can do anything, that God is unconstrained by anything, certainly not by man's notion of reason. You can't apply any notion of reason to him. He is willful, capricious, uh, may keep things in the order we observe simply because he wishes to for a while. But if he wants to turn an acorn that's growing into an oak tree into a giraffe, he may do so, and there's no gain saying it. If will is primary, reason is so diminished that uh, the laws of nature disappear. The essences in nature disappear. Uh, because of his epistemology, it becomes very difficult to say what anything actually is anymore. And the this kind of Occamist thinking spread very widely in the uh, Benedictine monasteries. Martin Luther was taught it. And unfortunately, this kind of thinking infected uh, parts of the Reformation, which embraced this voluntarist theology. Now let's translate the voluntarist theology politically, even though people like Martin Luther were not political philosophers, they did buy into that part of Occam, as did others. You know, I would say others did not, so this is not a uniform thing. Uh, here's the, here are the political effects. Uh, the prince became supreme. First of all, the um, institutional structure of the church was destroyed. So any uh, the, the functionality of having the spiritual order's autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the temporal order's autonomy was, was gone because the structures of the spiritual autonomy were, were destroyed. There now was only the temporal uh, uh, autonomy and power to which now all the spiritual powers were given. The prince now became the head of the church. The churches became national institutions, not universal institutions. And this happened largely in Protestant areas, but it also happened in Catholic areas. Why? Because in those religious wars, the only way a region could remain Catholic was to completely rely upon the power of the Catholic prince or king 
who wished to keep his his area Catholic, and therefore you find, uh, you know, developing the the loathsome uh, uh, relationship between throne and altar. So this teaching had broad effects everywhere. The prince was strength, strengthened immeasurably. The idea of popular sovereignty was dismissed. The uh, right to representation, the right to consent, and of course the right to revolution went out the window. Uh, this became manifested in the divine right of kings as it was announced by the early stewards. Am I running out of time? Are you getting anxious, Joe? <laughs> All right, let me cut to the chase. I can't go into details, but the divine right of kings is a lot of fun. As it was enunciated by James I and uh, his biggest defender, Robert Filmer, he was answered, by the way, by great Catholic thinkers like Cardinal Bellarmine, and the Jesuit Francisco Suarez, who resuscitated all the natural law and constitutional principles to critique James I, his champion Robert Filmer tried to uh, counter with that. And then the great Protestant thinkers arose against Filmer, mainly Algernon Sidney in his discourses on government. Sidney relying greatly upon the great theological uh, uh, theologian in the late Elizabethan uh, era, Richard Hooker. I can't get into that because I know Joe's getting anxious, but this great figure of Richard Hooker who had a big influence in the colonies, big influence on Algernon Sidney, a big influence on John Locke. John Locke and Alger Sidney were the two greatest influences on the American colonies. They resuscitated the right to revolution, the requirement of consent, popular sovereignty. So what you, you can see in the American Revolution is a restoration of the medieval political uh, constitutional principles, a restoration of these things, albeit done in a brilliant and unique way. Uh, so that briefly, that's how I train, show the lineage to rebut the idea that the United States is just the product of the French Enlightenment. Sorry, Joe. Bob, no apologies necessary. Thank you for that, really. Just a tour de force, really provocative talk. And I got to just hold up your book here because what you do in the book is so masterful, uh, America on Trial, because as, as, you, as we just kind of, kind of suggested here, you're bringing to... <laughs> I'll, I'll hold it up too. <laughs> Nothing like shameless self-promotion there, Bob Riley. I uh, know. <laughs> uh, what you do in the book so masterfully is weave together the history, the political philosophy, the theology, and it's incredibly readable. That's the thing. It's so accessible. So I just love the book, love this provocative thesis you've just laid out here, the American experiment as a, as a restoration of these ancient, classical, Judaic, Christian ideas. Now, one of the questions that uh, one of our members of the audience gave us here, Kurt, uh, Kurt Barron, I want to play off it because I was going to ask something like this. Uh, Kurt is asking, you know, how do we begin to change the conversation away from the secular crowd and, and other critics of the American founding, even conservative critics, to show these people that the first principles of our founding are at their root religious in nature, that the first principles are religious? Because, Bob, as you've suggested, um, what many on the right, at least some on the right, are saying is that, well, the, the American experiment rejected Christendom. It rejected all these things. And you've just delivered a partial response to that. But maybe to Kurt's question, how do we change the conversation to show that the principles of the founding are, at their root, religious? Yeah, Joe, you and I have uh, discussed this privately, but it, it, it was a Christian founding. They were overwhelmingly Christians in the founding. Now, uh, that doesn't necessarily make it a Christian founding in the sense that it tried to embody something of the Christian churches. But as far as natural religion is, uh, goes, natural uh, reason, philosophy, and 
the great influence of the Christian churches uh, in symbiosis with these truths, it was the powerful alliance that made the American founding possible. So the very first thing I would advise anybody to do who has trouble with this is read the preamble of the Declaration of Independence. Name me another nation's founding document that has God in it four times. Uh, the God of uh, nature's laws. As I've said, the, the laws of nature and of nature's God. Well, those laws of nature come from nature's God. He's their origin. And then the creator God. From where do we get and how possibly could these rights be inalienable? They could only be inalienable if they came from this creator God. And that is asserted right at the top of the Declaration of Independence. We are also told that he is, he is divine providence. So he is, he is actively involved in creation to, to help encouraged to see that the best thing for man takes place. And the, the founders place themselves under his care. And, oh, and let, me, let me pick up that point, Bob, not to cut you off, but let me pick up that point of the founders placing themselves under that understanding of uh, human nature, the nature of human societies, the nature of God. The, the criticism against the founders coming from the hard right is this radical individualism. You made reference to it in the opening remarks. Radical individualism of Locke and the founders. How do you uh, push back against uh, the critics? We know how the left thinks about this. They love radical individualism. But your thesis seems to be something very different. Yeah, there's an individualism, but it's also somehow tempered or tamed or framed. How do you, how do you want to describe that? Well, let's, let's be very careful here. Uh, my, what my book does is demonstrate that all of the principles articulated in the Declaration uh, predated the Declaration of Independence by a considerable period of time. Wow. I mean, after all, it was, uh, uh, it was Robert Bellarmine in the 16th century who said, all men are created equal and are born free. Uh, Francisco Suarez said the same thing as just a little later, so would Algernon Sidney. Uh, and, and of course, John Locke said it too. Now, I don't think anyone would dispute uh, the first three thinkers I mentioned and suggest that there's some element of radical individualism in, in them. <laughs> However, as you know, Jock, uh, uh, sorry, Joe, since you've done so much of your academic work on Locke, Locke is a problematic figure and, and he can be taken many ways. And, and the most, uh, uh, Wilson, the greatest natural law thinker of the American founding saw there were problems in Locke, but the part of Locke that was used uh, most avidly in the American founder and what gave him influence there was his powerful argument for revolution, the right to revolution. And since that's what they were on the cusp of, uh, that's why he was important. After the revolution, you know, there wasn't another uh, edition of Locke's works for 140 years. But yeah, and I, uh, I take your point on that, Bob, and I think I'd also want to encourage the audience, if you've got more questions, we've got a few minutes left, you want to throw some questions here in the chat box. One of the challenges here, Bob, it seems, is that uh, America has established this separation of church and state, a quote unquote, a, a, a secular republic, at least that's how some describe it, right? The separation of church and state. But it seems to me that Locke's um, desire to institutionally separate the two, which was picked up by the founders, was not to marginalize religion from, from public life, but to somehow give it a free reign, uncoerced by government. The idea of human agency and choice, right? Do you want to maybe just uh, comment on that? How important is this idea of freedom of conscience, freedom of religious belief? To oh, the it's, it, yeah, essential. It's an essential notion without which there wouldn't have been a founding. And we have to realize the problem Locke was trying to overcome in his second treatise were the virulent 
uh, religious civil wars on the continent and in England, where if you interpreted scripture a slightly different way, well, we were going to kill you. And these vicious civil wars were, were tearing uh, civic society into shreds. Exactly. He thought, you know, is there a way in which we can can live uh, that doesn't base everything on different readings of scripture, but is there something to undergird it? And he came up, of course, with the state of nature and the laws of nature, which were morally good and undergird society from which you could build uh, this Republican form of government in which, of course, religion would have a very important role, but it, it was separate from the state. And as, yes. and as he said, just as, just as uh, Christianity made the point, it's the state is not the vehicle for your salvation, it's the church. So the yes, church exactly is the right, Bob. important thing in your life. And when and Alexis de Tocqueville came to the United States, he saw that in spades. That's what he remarked upon most was, was this conjunction of a profound and deep religious faith, faith of the American people and how, yes. how harmoniously conjoined it was with the civic order. He said yes. in Europe, where, where it loggerheads were fighting each other all the time, here it's in yes. harmony. So this yes, is it's the first thing. It was the first thing that struck Tocqueville's attention. I want to give. We got time. I think there's another question here from Dr. Henry. Now, does this interpretation of the founding uh, uh, self-government um, is it not available for non-Christian people? The way that you're grounding it religiously. What about for non-Christian people or non-religious people or agnostics or whatever? Uh, uh, Bob, what would you say? Yes, yes, of course it is. Uh, the founders were very careful not to uh, institute a state religion. As I say, they certainly used, utilized natural religion in the ways in which they spoke about God in the Declaration of Independence. Um, so, uh, and you, you can talk to, or just observe George Washington, his moving speeches to uh, the Jews at their synagogue, his moving speeches to the Catholics, you know, to say to Catholics then, even you are welcome, as they weren't welcomed by a lot of the colonists. Yes, yes. Um, this this showed the breadth of uh, the, the uh, he said, don't use the word tolerance. That's like something the state gives you. We only use the term religious freedom because yes. that's what God has instilled. So no, the doors are open for people from other uh, faiths and other religions with this proviso. So long as their faith cannot accept the fundamental, immutable, transcendent principles at the foundation of the United States, if they do not believe there's a, a, a God of nature, if they don't believe there is a creator who gave inalienable rights, uh, then that's not going to work. If the Aztecs want to open up shop and start ripping out hearts so the sun rises tomorrow, <laughs> no, can't be a good American citizen. So it 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 extends as the founders spoke of this in this way. Any reasonable religion, any reason, any religion that didn't violate reason at its core was welcome. Thank you, Bob. That is just uh, splendid. The, 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 the generosity, I think, of the founding vision, the welcoming generosity, that's why so many people of all different religious groups and people with no faith have found a home here, it seems to me. Bob, I want to just close here now by reading a couple of lines from your book, and then we'll, uh, we'll close it out. Right at the end, you have a very hopeful note that is worth, uh, is worth reminding our audience of, that this, the rejection of the founding, the rejection of these religious ideals your argument is that it, it, it's going to lead to nowhere, that the loss of faith and the loss of reason is actually a cause for hope. It proved to be the downfall of the Soviet empire, you say, which imploded from its own hollowness. We can avoid the cataclysm anytime we choose by returning to reality, to reason, to the laws of nature and nature's God. Logos wins in the end. May that be the hope and the prayer of every American. Thank you, Bob Riley. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today at the Heritage Foundation Kirk Lecture Series.
We'll see you next time. Thank you, Joe. Greatly appreciate it. God bless you.